Hello and welcome back to Not Overthinking. Tamor, how are you doing today? Doing pretty well. I just had brunch with a friend and we're here recording the pod. And you, you had a little house party last night? We had a little house party last night. Yeah. We had about how, 30 people in attendance. How was it? Yeah, what, what's, your, what's your post-party analysis? Yeah, it was good. I thought it was good vibes. Postpartum analysis, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So um, post-party analysis yeah. was, it was pretty solid. It was good vibes. Um, I think probably, I think it's good to have a big mass party once in a while. But mm -hmm. I think I do prefer the more intimate dinner, six to eight people yeah. vibe more frequently than that. So how many, there were like 20 people, 25 people in the end or something? I don't know. I lost count. I had, yeah, I'd say there was maybe 20 to 25 at the peak. So maybe 25, I'd say, at the peak. And then, yeah. Who knows? But yeah, it was good. We had some party food and then we had some pizzas that we ordered. And we had a lot of pizza left over at the end. So, so what's the, if you prefer the smaller vibe, mm. what's the value of doing like a big sort of standing around talking party? I don't know. I think it is nice because you can then invite more people. And you can then do that initial introduction of like different friendship groups, where if you're just doing more intimate dinners, then you have to be very intentional about the people that you invite. That's true, yeah. And you can't just sort of mass invite a whole group of friends with like a whole other group of friends, because then you end up with like 15, 20 people. Um, so I think that kind of thing is good. Yeah, it's, I think it's mostly about inc being sort of the ability to be inclusive in terms of invites. Like I have a few different groups where it's like, I would like one group to meet another group. <clears throat> And so, yeah, the house party, the mass party initiates that and then the dinners can then be afterwards and then people don't feel snaked, I hope. I see. Yeah, I think like if you've met someone loosely at a sort of mass party, mm. then if you meet them afterwards at a smaller situation, you know, the, the social fabric is existing and you're kind of, you know, you skip a few stages. Yeah. And also we had kind of a big um, a mass party-ish a couple of weeks ago. And there were a few connections made through that of people who had never met each other who then became friends independently oh, cool, outside nice. of it. Yeah, yeah. That, that kind of stuff. So that's cool. It's cool to be able to facilitate that kind of connection. Mm. Almost like a sort of <laughs> a big networking event. Right, yeah. Um, but yeah. But a successful party overall. Pretty successful party, I think. We, uh, or rather, Lucy did most of the cleanup this morning. Mm. So we had a bit of a, a, bit of a, um, a disagreement about that. What was the disagreement? The disagreement, well, it was that um, I got up, went to the gym, came back, and then Lucy had already done the bulk of the tidying up. Ah. And Lucia's position was that if I actually cared about tidying up, I should have done it uh, before going to the gym. So we had a little bit of a discussion around that. What was the conclusion? Conclusion was that I should be more responsible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was, like, what was like the work split preparing for the party? It sounds like post-party, Lucia did most of it. I think pre-party, Lucia did most of it as well. Really? Yeah, I think Lucia was like the sort of driving organizing force behind it, telling me, have you, have you figured out who, who's on the guest list yet? Have you figured out who's on the guest list yet? Have you mm -hmm. sent the invites yet? I was like, oh, crap. Yeah, good point. Yeah. And, and still, with all that, I still had to send some last minute invites because I'd forgotten some people <laughs> or I had them on the list, but then I'd forgotten to message them. So I think it reflected that I'm generally a more last minute kind of guy when it comes to organizing stuff. Mm. And Lucia is not, which meant the party was actually have to happen and successful because it needed that kind of pre-organization, which, which Lucia did all the work for. Yeah, I do think there's an asymmetry if... I mean, it's it's kind of like this at home sometimes as well, right? Where, you know, Mimi will want something, you know, want something to be clean or something, you know, quick, like, quicker, right now. Than, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, quicker than like you or I would. You just have to stick to the level of the person who wants the thing done earliest. And you just have to kind of roll with that, really. Otherwise, it's very like asymmetric. It is. I think there is room for compromise here. It's like the person who wants things done to be cleaned at all times can give a bit more leeway, for example, of being mm. like, okay, if this gets cleaned right now or three hours from now, it actually doesn't make that much difference to my life and I can choose to live, with, live like that. But mm. I think it, you know, it's about finding a compromise between two people's natural states. Mm. Because I think otherwise what you end up in is, with is a situation where the person who is less chill about most things yeah. then ends up making the other person less chill about most things and that adds a degree of like oh crap am i doing the right things to stay ahead of this person's less chillness mm. about stuff right right um yeah i think communication all the way forward and nice yeah growth mindset and all that jazz good stuff I want to mention if anyone's watching this on the youtube video where i was sitting in this awkward position because i've realized that uh, i was in a i was in an acro yoga class on monday where i currently still don't have the ability to actually lift up my legs really um but pre-class as we were waiting for the class to start i was kind of sitting down and one of the girls was sitting sitting like this kind of l-shaped back against the wall yeah and i mentioned that my hamstrings are really inflexible she was like 
yeah, it's it's a super easy way to make them more flexible. Is just sit like this. Oh, really? So when you're on your laptop or on your phone, yeah, yeah, so you yeah. literally just sit like this, where you're getting a default passive yeah. hamstring stretch. Nice. So now I'm trying to do more of this as I'm yeah, doing day to day activities. I do find like yes, it's it's super satisfying not to sit on the sofa, but to sit like this against the sofa. I sometimes mm. just do that at home just because it feels good. Maybe that's why it feels good. Yeah, you're stretching out the hamstrings, Ugh. and then do the active stretch occasionally. Nice. It's good vibes. Apparently, this is what gymnast kids do. They're told to sit like this and also like with the legs out so that they can kind of mm. stretch the groin muscles as well. But I thought that would be a bit inappropriate on the pod. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if it's in shot, but yeah, who knows. All right, so what are we talking about today? You have a topic? I have a topic. Um, I've been reading a book by our mutual friend, Paul Millard. Oh, Paul Millard. Featured, on the podcast. Um, featured in 2020, I believe. Indeed. And Paul has written a book called The Pathless Path, which is very good. And I've highlighted the shit out of it. And I'm, half, I'm halfway through. Paul has also been very kind and sent us a bunch of physical copies to the studio. Hmm. And it's actually come incredibly handy. So um, basically, any time a friend visits the studio, they're always inevitably having some kind of some kind of career crisis. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm always like, oh, <laughs> I have the book for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I give them a free copy of The Path of Path. So what's the premise of the book? I guess it's about the relationship, uh, sort of changing our relationship with work. Hmm. And Paul's story, for anyone who might be familiar with the episode we did about him, or we, did, we did with him, we'll link it down below, is that he used to be a management consultant, worked at like McKinsey, worked in new york you know lived that fairly traditional corporate drone life and realized that he was kind of a little bit unhappy he was sort of maybe chasing the wrong things he was trying to keep up with the proverbial joneses um unhappy with making things like you know, making six figures a year because that wasn't enough to live comfortably in new york and then at one point he decided to quit the job and like you know travel the world do his own thing and do a little bit of freelancing and contracting here and there to, to pay the bills. But he since then, he's sort of been writing for the last few years online about yeah what it's like kind of stepping away from the quote, rat race, although that's not a phrase that he uses very often because um, it's yeah. a bit disparaging. Um, <laughs> I imagine. We'll use it anyway. <laughs> I'll use it anyway. Um, everyone kind of knows what the vibe is there and what it's like to reimagine your relationship with work and reimagine your identity with work. And it's, it's like, you know, the thing that we do for work is so intrinsically tied up with our identities in mm. most most of society and probably most people listening to this, when you introduce yourself, you introduce yourself as a doctor or a writer or a noun, mm. the thing that you do for work. Um, and rather than, you know, your hobbies, for example. Mm. And one thing that actually we were th um, on, on, on a related note, um, I was discussing with uh, Jack and Inez who are helping me with uh, book research. We were talking about the idea of like, um, how do we encourage ourselves to go back to the way we were as kids where we got intrinsic motivation out of doing mm, things yes mate and if you ask a kid to introduce him themselves they will not say i'm a year five student mm, yeah. they will introduce them themselves they'll be like my name is whatever and i enjoy a b and c they tend yeah. to introduce themselves by by, by their hobbies. I like dinosaurs yeah yeah whereas as we do as we grow to becoming adults we stop identifying with our hobbies and start identifying with that thing that we do as our job yeah and it was particularly interesting, um, Jack, uh, who's helping me with, with with research for the book, he's also a YouTuber. He's, he's got a bunch of things going on. He, it just so happens that like the 15th thing on his list is that he's a part-time research assistant for my book. And he moved to Paris recently and people would ask him what he does. And he found himself saying, oh, I'm a book research assistant. Hmm. Where, uh, where even he doesn't spend that much time on it. Even though he doesn't spend that, that much time on it. And it's like, you know, he's, he's like a huge YouTuber. He's like works in the publishing industry. He's got, he's, got, he's got a bunch of different things that I would think of as Jack's like kind of list of things that he does yeah and i would be i would put very low on the list that he he helps me out with book research mm. but that was the most tangible thing that directly relates to economic output yeah, yeah and yeah. so it was interesting that that's just by default how we find ourselves introducing ourselves mm. anyway i have a bunch of highlights on this book so i, I wonder if we just kind of go through them do you have any any introductory thoughts yeah my only introductory thought is that in a lot in a lot of anime there's kind of this trope of the sort of uh, the o the older character who's like been around for a bit and is now like not officially involved in things and now has some you know sort of like you know day to day job as you know they run like a little corner store or something um, 
like I, I feel like this is a trope in in anime where like there'll be some you know fairly unassuming kind of character <coughs> who'll introduce himself as like oh you know i just run this humble little corner shop <laughs> or whatever and then like as the plot thickens you find that like they're sort of you know very very involved and it used to be like really legendary in like the the hierarchy of, of, of everything and have like crazy powers and stuff and then they kind of they get involved in other things when they need to come in but like they'll introduce themselves as like oh you know i'm just uh I'm just in the corner shop you know <laughs> it's like i think it's I think it's in that case it's like an aesthetic choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, but it would yeah, I think for the anime trope it would also probably be quite hard to describe what, what you know if they had to introduce themselves. Yeah. It would be hard to describe. But that that just came to mind. I don't know how relevant that is here, but I do think it's yeah, kind of maybe. like a funny, a funny Yeah, little it kind of kind of reminds me of uh General Iro and uh, Oh, okay. Avatar. Avatar, right, yeah. Yeah. What does he do? He just like sips tea all day. Or he, he yeah, sips, sips, sips tea all day and hangs out with his with his nephew. Yeah, <laughs> he just like roams around. But then it turns out he's got this in, a whole backstory and he's an absolute legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so classic. Fun. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, so introduction. Here's a here's a highlight. Uh, th the pathless path is an alternative to the default path. It is an embrace of uncertainty and discomfort. It's a call to adventure in a world that tells us to conform. For me, it's also a gentle reminder to laugh when things feel out of control and trusting that an uncertain future is not a problem to be solved. Mm. And I highlighted that because I think um, generally the way when I think about what I want to do with my career, I feel like I, by default, don't like embracing uncertainty. Right. I feel like I should have some kind of plan. And even though I know that plan is going to change over time, at least there should be a plan, right? And this is something that Mimi often you know, says to me. That it's just like, why don't you have a plan? And I've only recently become comfortable being like, bro, I don't need a plan and kind of em embracing that thing. But I still haven't fully internalized and feel sort of feeling internally, uh, internally comfortable with the idea of not having a plan. Right, right. Um, he says, he writes, on the pathless path, my conception expanded and I was able to see the truth. Uh, oh, actually, oh, right, so a whole paragraph. Uh, one of the biggest things the pathless path did for me was to help me reimagine my relationship with work. When I left my job, I had a narrow view of work and wanted to escape. On the pathless path, my conception expanded and I was able to see the truth that most people, including myself, have a deep desire to work on things that matter to them and bring forth what is inside them. It is only when we cling to the logic of the default path that we fail to see the possibilities for making that happen. Here's another highlight. John Maynard Keynes once pointed out that it is better for reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. Mm. It's kind of interesting. He talks about this idea of like life scripts, which we've talked about on the pod a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About like, you know, job, you know, school, college, university, job, first house, married, kids, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work your way up the corporate ladder, as it were. And as he writes, while very few young people expect to have one job or career, most still rely on the logic of the default path mm -hmm. and assume they need to have everything figured out before the age of 25. Prior to embracing the pathless path, I was the friend that people came to when they had career challenges. I once worked closely with a young professional in his mid-twenties who wanted to escape his current job. As he described his career options, he told me he could keep progressing at his company and become a partner, or he could take a position at a client's firm and coast, as he put it. Hmm. Are those the only two options? I asked. Yes, he replied. I listed a few other parts that he conceded were possible, but he added, I don't know anyone who has done that. Many people fall into this trap. We are convinced that the only way forward is the path we've been on or what we've seen people like us do. This is a silent conspiracy that constrains the possibilities of our lives. And yeah, that really resonated because, you know, a few months ago, we did an episode where you were critiquing, critiquing my decision to apply to MBA mm. programs, yeah. American universities, where I think what we, what we figured out there is that I have this like, in my position anyway, like all of these different things I could do, but really the only paths that I know people have done are, for example, medicine, startup, or like back to university. Mm. And so those then feel like, oh, I have three options to choose from yeah. rather than I can I actually have an unlimited number of options to choose from and I can actually figure out what I personally want to do rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. just pick one of these options that sort of I know other people have yeah, done. Yeah. But I think it also it also ties into some of the stuff we've talked about before around expanding your box and how if you don't know people who have, yeah. for example, started a company or started a YouTube channel or written a book, it's very hard to genuinely see that as a thing that you could do. Mm. And for example, with you making your university choices, it was through meeting a cousin of ours yeah, yeah, yeah. who had done maths at university that you realized, oh, this is actually an option. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. Whereas if you just sort of opined about it in advance, you probably wouldn't have seen yeah, that, yeah. that this yeah. thing is an option because these default paths and life scripts that we follow and the way that we are thinking is constrained inside this box. Mm. It's actually very hard to step outside of it unless you hear an example or see an, exa or see an example. 
And that's why I'm very big on, for example, listening to podcasts of people who like travel the world and just like do that kind of thing. Because then suddenly it's like, oh, this thing is a possibility and I can I can do something like this. Yeah. I think the, the life scripts are kind of just defined by, you know, what the majority of people around you are sort of doing. I think it can, f- it can feel like there's more of an active force pushing you that way than just like... Yeah, I, I I think partly it is just that like it's it's hard to see what the options are unless you've seen someone else do a particular thing, but I think it, it's it's not ju- it's not just that like look you're in a cave and there's like three tunnels and you have to choose one of the tunnels. It's also that that like there's a wind that's pushing you into one of those tunnels. You know, like there's a you know there's also a force pushing you down. No, and it's not just like for you to like amble into one of these tunnels. You know, I, I think economic stability is a big part of it, man. Um, I think certainly as a, you know, as a guy, I think, you know, the core messages that society gives you is like, look, you need to be able to provide, right? And, and so I think certainly for me, I I do feel a push of like, look, I need, I need to be able to provide to my future family. And I need economic stability for that. You know, that that's kind of pushing you down the sort of legible routes to economic stability, which is like the things that people around you would have done. Uh, I, I think, I, th- I can't remember what we talked about it in that episode. Certainly as like a teenager, you know, a few years ago, whatever, my thinking would have been like, look, for my future hypothetical family, I need to be in like a good spot. Like, I don't personally care about like having lots of money or anything like that. Like I, you know, but I, I do care about it to the extent that I want to be able to provide, you know, essentially. And so I think, I think what, uh, yeah, I remember when we were talking to, about, talking to Paul, he said like one, I think he, I hope I'm not like speaking out of tone here, but he, I, I do think he said that like he was quite worried about, I think he was like single at the time, you know, he'd kind of been dating a little bit and he was kind of worried like, you know, if I'm not in a traditional successful career type thing in the big city, like, you know, would would people want to be in a relationship with me kind of thing? Like, would they see me as like a long-term prospective partner or would they see me as this like, hippie dude who's uh you know on some vision quest kind of vibes and he said that a lot of that changed when he met his i think now partner and she was also like sort of not down down for the sort of the pathless path and that made him a lot more kind of comfortable with it i think a lot of path anxiety comes from like hypothetical pressure of mate selection you know and actually, one of the things that a few people in certain Twitter circles say, I think there's a guy called Justin Murphy who says this and other people, is that, you know, one of the greatest things once, you, once you've like, you know, gotten married or whatever or found, found like a long-term partner is that you can, you, you realize just how much, how much stuff you were doing in order to like <laughs> get, get the mate in the bag, <laughs> I think is, is the term that we use, right? Uh, after you've kind of done that, then you kind of re- realize what, you know, just how many shackles you were in because of this sort of hypothetical of like, I need to do X, Y, and Z in order to, you know, secure a mate. Um, and then once, once you're kind of, once you've got, got the mate in the bag, then you're kind of truly free to, you know, explore things and discover yourself, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and just be way more weird. I think, yeah, part, I think path anxiety is, is kind of, uh, of sort of, a variance reducer and i think it comes from it comes from mate anxiety oh yeah to whatever extent i had or have path anxiety i think it mostly comes from that it doesn't come from me thinking like oh i need like lots of money because i want to have x y and z do you know what i mean I where, does, what you where mean. does your path anxiety come from i think my path anxiety comes from oh interesting so he actually has uh, a few like so because so, so paul's had a, you know apparently hundreds hundreds of conversations with people who have path anxiety over the years mm. he's probably boiled it down to sort of five things that um people, mm, nice. people struggle with like a list of five and for me it was, it was two of them that were the problem let me see if i can find it i think more more people will have to start facing facing these questions because i think more than it was ever possible before it is now it is now much more achievable to sort of become post-economic mm. at a much younger age what do you mean by post-economic like at the, at the point where like you know you you can you can get enough money that you could you could actually be like 
damn, I actually don't need to work anymore. Like if I want, if I wanted to like, you know, just live sensibly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually need a job. You know, it, it, like for example, a bunch of people kind of make a lot of money through startups or like through crypto. I have a friend who's, you know, just, yeah, basically post-economic now from crypto stuff over the past few years and is now like facing into the void of like, okay, what, what now, <laughs> mm. you know? And so I think, I think because of technology and because of the, the leverage that it brings, I think more people will sort of be facing this. Yeah, let's not forget that this is still the, a very, very, very small yeah, yeah. sliver of society yeah, for sure. um, who are facing facing this issue. Uh, so he writes, in, in hundreds of conversations with people with people, I found that these fears uh, fall into one of the following five categories, or five areas. Success, what if I'm not good enough? Money, what happens if I go broke? Health, what if I get sick? Belonging, will I still be loved? And happiness, what if I am not happy? Mm. And I think for me, it's number two and five. So money, what happens if I go broke? And happiness, what if I'm not happy? Wait, you care about what happens if I go broke? Yeah, I think what that's... What do you mean? Yeah, that's, what does that mean? So that's a significant part of my sort of desire to have some sort of plan. Because it, it's, it's, it's a feeling of... I think for me, the so kind of the uh, most likely worst case scenario is I would then have to go back to medicine. And that like now that I've tasted the autonomy and freedom of and stuff of doing my own thing and doing it reasonably well it's like I think I very much overcorrect for that feeling of financial safety which is which is actually the thing that Paul writes about as well apparently this is like an absolute classic where even as you make more money you feel that you need even more of it to have a financial safety net mm. and I currently feel like I still need more money to have more of that safety net such that if, you know, the YouTube stuff and the book stuff and all the other stuff doesn't work out, then I will still be okay. And so that's just like a sort of sort of grumbling level of kind of anxiety in the background. And the other one is yeah, what are I... You, but yeah. you, are you, I always thought the broke thing is really more about these other things of like, oh, if I'm broke, maybe people will stop loving me or people will think I'm a loser or whatever. Oh God, no, I, I, don't, I don't care at all about those things. You actually just care about like, what if I have no money and need to get a real job? Yes. Genuinely. Like, I think yours has always been, what if people think I'm, uh, like, what if people don't love me and what yeah, if people, yeah, yeah. like, um, pity me and, and stuff? Yeah, yeah, the pity one, that's, yeah. that's not a factor at all in my, in my kind of Wild. rational of this. I know, it's mental, isn't it? Mine's literally the, the, that. What, what if I need to actually get a real job? Um, or, and a real job that I might not enjoy. And if I see people who were on that path that I was, and their kind of worst case scenario is, you end up, I don't know, as a registrar or as a consultant really not enjoying your job but you need it to pay the bills and etc cetera, etc cetera, and you feel like you then can't go anywhere else because you're sort of stuck in this career mm. and it's paying the bills and it's it's okay but it's it's not the thing you actually want to be doing mm. so that's like a big was a big fear of me uh, of, of mine and the other one was this this happiness one like what if i'm not happy not happy doing what not happy doing kind of pathless path type stuff oh like what if uh you know for example in about a boy Mm, uh, Hugh song. Grant um, ha makes t tons of royalties off the back of a song that his granddad wrote or something like that yeah. <laughs> and he ends up never needing to work and so he just sort of screws around watching DVDs all day and like kind of being a bit of a waste man yeah. and is n not particularly happy Yeah. and so I think of that as being like a you know and it's a, it's a bit of a stupid thing because it's not like I would just sit around doing nothing I would find stuff that feels meaningful to do mm. but and then like you know i like i imagine 20 like 20 years from now when i'm like i don't know 47 do i really want to be kind of grinding what's up guys <laughs> welcome back to the channel <laughs> <laughs> don't really, really, really want to being like i've just released a new course about how to yeah. make money on the internet guys we're on our 43rd annual yeah. cohort <laughs> yeah. so I, I think of those as like a would would i be happy doing that uh, Can we talk about yeah. that for a second? Please. Why does that feel cringy to you? Like, why, why does that feel so bad to you? If you're happy doing it now, like, why does it, why does it not seem like something a, a thirty-year-old or a, a thirty-five or a forty-year-old should be doing with their lives? Oh no, I don't. Th I don't think it's about the age. I, th I just think it's about the, like, I, I, I probably the stasis. The, yeah, the stagnation. Stasis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't want to be doing the same thing for an extended period of time. Probably. Just because it doesn't feel like progress. Yeah, probably. But like, yeah, I've often thought about this because like, I never realized this, but for example, people who host talk shows like David Letterman, Conan, they've hosted their talk shows for like 30 years straight. 
And I always think like, that's so weird. Like I feel, yeah, I, I've, I've, I, f I found that weird because I think I had this assumption of like, well, like you've got to be progressing somehow. Like how you, why, you know, what's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's the next step, bro? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 this is something that Tony Robbins talks about where he says that basically progress equals happiness. And if you're not making progress, you're very, very likely to become unhappy and depressed and all that, all that kind of stuff. And I, so, so it sounds like, I don't know. I don't like this mate. Uh, I mean, you know, the whole like desire of suffering and the desire to make progress is also probably un a little bit unenlightened. It's a, it sounds unlike yeah at the right level of scale I can get on board but it sounds yeah. unenlightened at a, on a big picture yeah. level. Um, so I, I suspect David Letterman and and equivalent are finding ways to progress and don't feel as it don't feel like they are kind of uh, telling oh uh, do you remember in, in in Space Jam yeah you know, uh, when Bugs Bunny tries to sell the story to Michael Jordan as to why he should join their team and he's like. You know, if we don't manage to win this game, we're gonna. I'm gonna end up being like one of those comedians who tells the same the, the same jokes every night for all eternity. Mm. And it's sort of you see you get this sort of flash forward where he's just like kind of on stage, absolutely miserable, just telling the same jokes over and over again. Mm. Um, so I like some, sometimes that thing comes to mind when I think of like, mm. do I really want to be doing the same thing ad nauseum forever? I see. But again, it's just it's just unli unli unlikely to actually be the case because I think we there's the, there's this classic like psychological phenomenon as it were uh where we like if we think of how we've progressed in the last 10 years it's been absolutely enormous but we think that we're not going to make any progress over the next 10 or you know the, the ways in which we're going to change over the next 10 years are like one uh you know two orders of magnitude less than the ways we have changed over the last 10 years uh just by just as like a default way of thinking mm. um so i think that ties into the whole what if i'm what if i'm not happy if where, where, when I project 20 years into the future, I imagine myself doing the same thing. And the mistake there is obviously that, you know, not taking into account the fact that things change, will opportunities arise. will arise, I'll figure things out as, as I go along. Yeah. Similarly, the what if I go, go broke one is like, what if my business starts to decline and I do absolutely nothing about it yeah, yeah, and it yeah. continues to decline and I still do absolutely nothing about it. And then, and then I sit around my money <laughs> and, then, and, random stuff. and then I spend all my money on random stuff, sit around for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, S and P 500 completely crashes, crypto completely crashes. And then I still, I'm still not doing anything at all. <laughs> and then I'm 47 and then I'm broken. Like <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. just, <laughs> it's just a completely bizarre kind of thought process. But as I, as I read those, I was like, Oh, my two main ones are what if I go broken? What if I'm not Does happy? Paul talk about the progress thing? I think the progress thing is, uh, is something to be dug into because I think, I think Conan's got it right, man. He got his talk show. Did his talk show. Yeah. And now, now that he's a bit older, right? He did a talk show for like, you know, 25, 30 years. Now, I think in the past couple of years, he kind of decided, actually, you know, there are aspects of the sort of standard talk show thing that I don't really like. I'm going to switch up the format. I'm going to have like a shorter talk show where I just like, we don't do random bits. I just talk to like guests that I want to talk to, mm. you know, 30 minutes rather than an hour. And I'm going to have my podcast, which I find really fun. And I, again, I get to talk to people. I'm going to do like these travel segments, you know, you know, I think there is there, there's progress in that sense of like him switching up the format and like moving towards a li you know a, a life and activities that he he prefers. If it feels like the the final stage should be something like that of like David Letterman yeah, like running fun, his talk show for the rest of his life, finding, <laughs> your, finding your infinite game. As it were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I think that's very reasonable, and I and I often think of mine as being. Like if I think, what is the stuff I'd like to do forever? I, I imagine something like, it would be cool to do some reading, writing, teaching, and documenting in some capacity. Mm. And, you know, broadly that on repeat is a pretty good life. Yeah. But, you know, it would be it, like, m most people don't, don't spend like 30 years working on a single book. They'd write a book and then the project's done and they're like, cool, let's move on to the next one. And so it, it's sort of like a sense of progression in that, in that way where the projects change, but maybe the, 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 act, the, if you zoomed out, the activities that lead to them don't necessarily. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, this is something that, uh, I've, I've, I've had a few conversations with, uh, writer Ryan Holiday, who's been kind of unofficially mentoring me on, on the book process. And he talks about, uh, so he's this, he's made his millions through selling books. Is he the guy stoic? So yeah, the stoic, like, stoic yeah. chap. Yeah. He seems to have a pretty solid life set up whereby he lives on this farm just outside of Austin, Texas. He does four hours of deep work in the mornings where he wakes up, uh, he goes to his little attic, he reads books, he writes, mm. takes a little notes in his note-taking system. 
And then afternoon he spends like going in nature, hanging out with the kids. And the evening he spends just like doing whatever. And he's like, yeah, every day I put in a good four hours of work and life is good. And he says that, um, one time, I was chatting to him in a podcast and he, he said at one point that, you know, so some of his friends have recently got into real estate. And he's like, huh, maybe I should get into real estate. You know, this yeah. writing thing seems a bit dry. And then he like, looks into, a bit of, into it a bit and he realizes that all of his friends who are in real estate want to leave real estate so that they can write self-help books. <laughs> and he's like, you know what? I've actually got it pretty good. And I just, you know, this is, this is actually my final state <laughs> and this is reasonable. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, it's about finding, finding that infinite game and sort of the way I'm th the way I'm thinking of it is, if I were to win the lottery or, and become like instantly post economic, mm. what would change about the way I'm spending my time? Yeah, and I want the answer to that question to be as little as possible. Yeah, sure. I think you're going back to your point. You said the whole yeah the mate mate anxiety mm. path anxiety uh, sprouts from mate anxiety. Yeah, I think it's probably almost almost anything. It's 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 not really something I consciously think about. Yeah, I guess if if I didn't have like the side hustles and stuff from day one, it would have been a bit of an anxiety around like if I if I was working as a doctor and didn't have side hustles already going, then like oh, leaving this job will make me unattractive to a potential mate. Mm. But I think in my case because those other things worked out, that was never really a consideration. Okay. Fair, yeah. Um was that actually a consideration for you? Well, if I don't do causal and if I end up kind of being a monk and like going to some badminton camp in China, <laughs> then people someone wouldn't want to marry me it wasn't so it's not so direct it's not it's not the thing that's top of mind but i think at the root is this like provider instinct mm. and that comes from that yeah i think we discussed this on the mate in the bag episode i can't remember which one that was yeah um, because there are a lot of people who say who, who say that sort of one's life is in two halves <laughs> the, the half spent finding a mate and then the other half spent figuring out what the hell you do once you found the mate yeah 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 i think venkatesh rao also says this he says that like uh, let me let me try and do. Uh, I won't spend long on this, but let me just try and do a quick Twitter search. Uh, I'm getting better at searching for <laughs> obscure Very tweets good. that I read a long time ago. While you're doing that, I'll read a few more quotes. Um, this is chapter two, getting ahead, where it opens with a quote from David White. Apparently, uh, the ease of having an ambition is that it can be explained to others. The very disease of ambition is that it can be so easily explained to others. Um, and he, he, he references uh, Agnes Callard, our, uh, yes, our favorite author of Aspiration, and describes the difference between ambition and aspiration, where ambition, and I, I hadn't quite got, got this distinction before, where, where ambition is striving for something that is in line with the values that you already hold. Mm, yeah. And aspiration Asp grasping is- Grasping for new values. Yeah, grasping for new values. Like, and, and now that I have that terminology, I'd-, I'd it's it's changed the way I'm approaching like traveling, because really? I don't have a pre-existing value of enjoying travel and wanting to explore new horizons and that kind of stuff. And so when I'd been thinking about, huh, it would be kind of cool to travel the world and stuff, I would also think at the same time, would I really enjoy traveling the world? Because yeah. like I don't, I don't intrinsically right now enjoy those sorts of things. Yeah. But I think that traveling the world is 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 an asp is aspirational in that. As I'm doing it, I hope that maybe I'll grasp some new values and gain an appreciation of this in a way that I, d I just currently don't have. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like, I think Agnes Callard uses the example of if you don't already enjoy art galleries, yeah. then it's hard to just will up the value that I enjoy art galleries. You have to actually go to a few art galleries, take it seriously for a bit. Not and enjoy then, it for a few times and yeah. keep going. And, and then eventually you'll be, you'll, 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 you, you get that appreciation of, oh, actually this art gallery stuff is pretty cool and I'm now enjoying it. And now you have this new value, which you have got gained as a result of aspiration. Yeah, yeah. Have you found your tweet? I found my tweet, yeah, I found it remarkably quickly. Uh, Very good. <laughs> VGR Venkatesh Rao. Uh, this is like mid mid thread. He says the twenties are easy. Almost everything people think they want turns out to be indirectly about wanting sex or a partner, or dealing with the inability to get them. Once you sort out your feelings about that, motivation around other things gets much simpler. Things get messy at age thirty. Yeah, he talks about how like wanting your sort of motivations for things. And well, I've kind of read his tweet about motivations about. Yeah, there's different motivations for things. There's wanting the thing. There's wanting to be seen to want the thing. There's wanting to do things that are needed to do the thing. 
there's one to wanting to want the thing wanting to want to do the thing you know there's lots of motivations yeah he says the, the older i get the more it sinks in that 90 percent of effectiveness is just about taking a thing seriously enough this translates to just wanting the thing itself rather than adjacent things that may or may not happen as a side effect most things sort themselves out if you're serious enough he says when you're serious you're naturally efficient because you don't get distracted by side goals you're naturally as productive as needed because under or overshooting uh because under overshooting what you seriously want um uh, most of the time, ambiguity in goal setting is not about wanting the wrong thing or being confused about sort of what mean what means lead to what ends. It's about wanting the thing wrong. So not wanting the wrong thing, but wanting the thing wrong. I think we've talked about this on the pod before. Hmm. Um, he says the inefficiency of unacknowledged goals cannot be uh, six sigma away. Six sigma is just like a process for quality assurance or something, you know, something like that. It's, it's just like a a process for doing work in a certain way you know you can't like you can't process your way out of having unacknowledged goals and i think a lot of like the angst and you know that kind of stuff um you know comes from i think he's saying it like comes from unacknowledged goals around like oh actually i want a maze or actually i don't want to be broke or whatever and this is quite interesting he he describes motivation as like not a single thing he says there's something like a starter motivation you know like the the thing that kind of gets you started he says many entrepreneurs start out with the chip on the shoulder kind of motive like wanting to prove their worth to someone who bullied them you know he says the good ones eventually graduate to actually wanting the thing that they're building you know like you know the, the chip on your shoulder can kind of get you started give you that boost but like if you want to be good and if you want to like stay in it a long time you have to actually directly want the thing that you're doing and he says motivation is a skill wanting things is not something you can just do beyond like age three when you want a lollipop he says you have to learn to zoom in on the thing that vaguely attracts you and then like yeah figure out like what's actually going on anyway some, some rough ideas yeah so that kind of um sparks a thought that i've been thinking a lot about in the book context which is Basically, extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Yeah, what's your motivation for the book? Um, I'll, 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 I'll come to that in a moment, um, okay. once I finish my point about. So, ex- extrinsic motivation, broadly defined as, uh, I want this thing, I want to do this thing for, for the rewards that it brings me. Intrinsic motivation, I want to do this thing for the joy or satisfaction or wanting of doing the thing itself. And when we start off as kids, we do things for intrinsic, intrinsically motivated reasons that I want to run around and play just because I want to run around and play because it's fun. Yeah. Whereas as we get older, it's like, I want to do these maths problems because it will get me a gold star. Um, I want to do well in this exam because it will get me into university. I want to do all these things because of something else. It will yeah. get me a job or status or prestige or money or whatever. And extrinsic motivation crowds out intrinsic motivation. So there's a bunch of studies that are like really well done that show that when people enjoy something and then you pay them for doing the thing, they start to enjoy it less mm. and they stop doing the thing unless they are then being paid for it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's this thing of motiva- m- motivation for wanting the results of the thing rather than motivation for wanting the thing itself. Mm. It just sounds like what Venkatesh is talking about, like, you know, simplified to, do you want to do this thing for extrinsic reasons? In which case, that's fine, it works, but it's temporary and not particularly powerful. Yeah. It's more like a spark. Whereas, do you want to do this thing for intrinsic reasons? I I just genuinely enjoy doing the thing. In which case, that's where you don't really need to worry about motivation anymore because you're just wanting to do the thing. Yeah. I th- uh, uh, a, a second point on the on the on the on the point of unacknowledged goals. I think I think that's really good. Like I've been working with a bunch. I've I've, I've been looking into and working with a bunch of life life coach type of people in the whole genre of how to figure out what to do with your life yeah. recently, and basically all of it comes down to actually figuring out what goals you actually want and there's all sorts of roundabout ways of going about it like all sorts of journaling prompts all sorts of questions uh trying to figure out what you don't want trying to figure out what your values are and what your strengths are and how you can combine those to figure out what you actually want yeah um taking a goal and then figuring out why do i actually want that thing and it's all just circling around this idea of what are the goals that you actually want to go for Mm. and great yeah, Once we yeah. have gotten to the root level of why you want it at that point we can build on that and figure out okay cool now let's figure out a way of doing it whereas i was uh, the, the the other day again to, to, to think of, of of tony robbins i was watching his uh, netflix documentary i am not your guru on the recommendation of someone who was on my deep dive podcast actually who said that he'd watched that documentary he thought wow this tony robbins guy is sick and attended one of his live events and that changed his life i was All like right. okay cool I'll, I'll watch this documentary and it and it opens it's it's like when his like one of his six day boot camps date with destiny where there's like twenty five hundred people in a convention center and he's like up on stage and like doing things and mm. um, you know this nineteen year old 
year old girl stands up and he asks, you know, what, what do you want to do this year? And she says, I want to lose weight. Or this is the year I want to take like my diet and exercise seriously. And he's, he sort of asks a few more questions. Like, why do you want that? Why do you want that? Why do you want that? And it turns out that this girl is just sort of looking for love from her dad or something yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. And how the thing that she thought she wanted was actually, you know, there was so much stuff underneath the surface. Mm. And I think that's, it's, it sounds maybe that's what Bangladesh is getting at. Like, what are the unacknowledged goals underneath the thing that yeah, you yeah, think yeah. you actually want? And that's where having someone to talk through about this who is experienced in asking why or like a life coach or like journaling prompts is useful in getting to that Mm. core motivation and need yeah um yeah yeah one of the um I, I think i mentioned on the pod about a year ago just over a year ago uh that i'd, I'd kind of had a few sessions with a sort of business therapist slash coach type person mm. and i think a large part of his shtick is that like if people are feeling a little stuck or unproductive etc you know it's usually it's usually an issue of their like core motivations rather than anything else and uh, a lot of his process revolved around like you know trying to get to the bottom of like core motivations and then finding out that oh actually something is something is a little off there and figuring that out rather than sort of yeah directly trying to be more productive or something how did he how, what was the process for figuring out core motivations i think it was just asking why a lot and like not believing most of the answers and then like eventually you know i might say something he's like you know a lot of times be like no i don't think that's it <laughs> then eventually be like yeah that sounds about right <laughs> kind of thick and he would just take that like yeah okay yeah i mean i didn't i don't know how much progress we made to be honest yeah i only had a couple of sessions um but yeah i think like the core motivations piece is like yeah i've certainly found that for myself that is what is often like throwing things out of whack sometimes. Hmm. Can you think of any examples of where you had something that you were motivated for wrong reasons and then you figured out the core motivation behind it? Yeah, I think maybe like a year or two ago. Yeah, I think around the sort of fear of being pitied thing. Hmm. You know, I think that was one thing. Yeah, but yeah, nothing else really comes so to that, mind. Has that helped you recognize that you have a fear of being pitied? Yeah, I feel like recognizing it has actually reduced it quite a lot. I don't think, I don't think I fear it that much. Yeah. Yeah, I guess often naming a fear. Yeah. Um, is that line from from Hermione in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? What's the line? Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. Oh, no. Nice. I think in the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. And you must be Miss Granger. <laughs> 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 yeah, Strago's told me all about you. <laughs> Your parents. Uncles, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to continue? <laughs> I don't remember the next line. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Tate, a second <laughs> book. <laughs> Tate. I love that one. Um, where were we? All right, we have to actually wrap, wrap things up in the next five minutes or so. Cool. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, I have so many. Was Is there things. anything he says about the, like, the progress piece? Mm. About seeking progress? Because I think, what you know... One of the appealing things about a lot of traditional paths is that there's a very clear sense of progress. Yeah. And once they once they have you down that, then I think people find it hard to leave that. Like there's clear progression, more title, you know, better title, salary boosts every year or two, etc. Mm. And I think that is a large part of. It. It's very appealing. Like who wouldn't want that? Yeah, he doesn't really write much about the progress okay. thing. Okay. I think I've I've noticed that in my life a lot. Where that's one of the things, ap apart from like the banter that I miss most about medicine, is that the, the, there is a very clear sense of progression. Mm. Where you know you can be like, okay, cool, another year, and now I have an extra. I am now SD three rather than an SD two. Yeah, and my salary has gone up by one thousand two hundred twenty four pounds and twenty three cents. Kind of vibe. Um, and you kind of know that, okay, if I follow this path and do things right and do my signups and take things and, and take the boxes and I, I will get better and I will also, um, be earning more and I will also like at, at every junction be progressing. Mm. Whereas that is a lot more, uh, well, illegible in pathless path type things. Mm. But also I think when you become a consultant in medicine and now you have like 35 years ahead of you where you have kind of reached the pinnacle at that point, I'm always interested in like, what are people doing in for the sake of progression? And at that point people start going after like awards. Um, sometimes those awards are made up by private companies wanting to sell things 
and they know that people are going after yeah, like yeah. A, a digital health fellowship award right, presented right. by this company that sells the, some software. Mm. And so the, pers- the the consultant buying the thing for their trust feels good that they have, they have been the recipient of the digital health fellowship award. Mm. So they sort of hack that thing, that desire to progress. And a lot of people who, well, a few people who go for, you know, becoming president of the Royal Society of Plastic Surgeons, or, you know, th- th- things like that, getting into management. Like, I think there's always a sense of, I want to progress and to do that next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even when the routes to doing so become become less yeah. less obvious. Um, yeah, be curious on Paul's take. Man, we should maybe have Paul back on the pod. Yeah, it would be good. Um, I think he's coming to London around June time. Is he ready? Um, oh, sick. Yeah, I messaged him asking me if he would come on, on the Deep Dive podcast as well. Mm. But it would be good. Nice. Be good to have him on. But yeah, otherwise, in the meantime, everyone check out The Pathless Path. And I guess, I mean, I still have about 18,000 highlights from it that we can just Yeah, I'm sure we'll touch on it again. Um, um, we can maybe end with, uh, with a review. I actually haven't read any reviews in a long time. Uh, how do we do that? I think Chartable is still the way to do that. Okay, so this is entitled Good Vibes from Riley X8 in America. Five-star review. I second another reviewer. I'm mostly here for the good vibes. There's wisdom I take away from each episode and the conversation is thought-provoking, but I think the reason I keep coming back is it's just so purely enjoyable and we need that in this world. Highly recommended. I'm a 30-year-old female holistic nutritionist and wellness coach living in Los Angeles. Not a 20-something tech bro, but somehow this podcast just hits. Uh, P.S. Found the podcast for Ali's YouTube videos, which I find useful and motivational when I'm considering procrastinating, despite Ali not believing in motivation. Uh, There's another five star review recently been here for years absolutely great uh great chill yet productive vibe just wish it can actually output one podcast per week <laughs> <laughs> nice Love we'll it. get we'll get better we'll get better thank you for the reviews keep coming uh and that's all for this week thanks for listening and we'll see you later bye